Hey, Tonglers. Here's our top five list of female horror villains. Number one, Syl from 1995's Species. Ah, yes. Syl is a female humanoid and the end result of a secret experiment to combine alien DNA with human genetic code. Classic. She alternates between her human form and Medusa-like alien form when she's angry. After Syl escapes from the secret facility she was grown at and undergoes a terrifying accelerated puberty via cocoon, she finds herself in Los Angeles with an overwhelming case of baby fever, brought on by catching glimpses of both pregnant bellies and intimate scenes on TV. Where's a good place to find a man? Well, there's plenty of guys at the end around the corner. It's a club. You won't have any trouble meeting somebody there. Though Syl starts off as a naive, sympathetic outsider. I don't know why I'm here. I don't know who I am, who sent me. Do you? No! She evolves very quickly into a ruthless and calculating man-eater, all a means to an end to fulfill her instinctual urge to have a child. For example, after another woman steals the attention of a man whose genetic material she desired, Syl jealously rips out her spinal cord in the bathroom. She also dispatches men whose DNA she deems unsuitable for her requirements. <laughs> and she doesn't handle rejection in the healthiest of ways. I want a baby. What? Excuse me? Eventually, Syl does find a suitable mate and successfully acquires his genetic material, resulting in the birth of the child she always wanted. Ultimately, Syl shows audiences that a primal instinct for motherhood can be the scariest thing of all. Number two, Mrs. Carmody from 2007's The Mist. Mrs. Carmody is the local religious zealot and one of the customers sheltered inside a grocery store when the strange mist arrives. The store patrons try to rationally speculate on the origins of the mist. Some kind of chemical explosion has to be. However, Mrs. Carmody prefers her explanation. It's death out there. It's the end of days. Stop it. Okay. And elaborates further, much to the annoyance of everyone else. It's judgment day. And it's come round at last. There is nothing more obvious or natural than that. Oh, fuck me. You've done that to yourself by a life of sin and dissolution. When a store employee is attacked by tentacles that emerge from the mist, this scares the people in the store, and they split into factions based on what they think they should do to survive. Some wish to fortify themselves in the store. Others want to leave and find help. But Mrs. Carmody has her own ideas. What are you proposing? that we all prepare to meet our maker. As the situation in the store deteriorates with people being picked off by the creatures in the mist, Mrs. Carmody's Judgment Day prophecies and sermons begin to win over the survivors. She was right. She said that it would happen like this. She said that they would come at night. She told us someone would die. Her growing cult of personality influence doesn't go unnoticed. Want another reason to get the hell out of here? I'll give you the best one. Her. Mrs. Carmody. She's our very own Jim Jones. After more are killed by the monsters on an expedition to the nearby pharmacy, one of the survivors, Private Jessup, reveals that the base he was stationed at was experimenting with opening portals to other dimensions. Mrs. Carmody and her followers do not take kindly to this information. The judgment is being brought down upon us. The fiends of hell, you see, they are let loose. And Star Wormwood blazes. And it is his fault. Yes, it is your fault. No, it is not my fault. And for his troubles, the mob sacrifices him to the creatures outside. The beast will leave us alone tonight. Tomorrow. Tomorrow, we'll just have to wait and see. Of course, the following day, things get worse. And Mrs. Carmody requests a new human sacrifice. It's from them. The blood of human sacrifice must come. The character of Mrs. Carmody shows us that the real monster is not the hidden monsters in the mist, but the hidden monsters lurking within your own friends and neighbors, unleashed by those who have abandoned reason and embraced hardline ideology. Number three. Rose the Hat from 2019's Dr. Sleep. Aptly named because of her unusual hat. My very, very best friends, they just call me Rose the Hat. 
Rose is the leader of a gang of witches who have unnaturally extended their lives by consuming steam, a metaphysical energy that exists inside psychic children. Honey, it's the special ones that taste best. Steam is made more palatable and potent through torturing the victim being harvested. Pain purifies steam. Fear too, so you understand. Together, Rose and her crew prowl across the United States in search of a dwindling number of psychic children to feed upon. They eventually cross paths with Abra, a powerfully psychic teenager determined to resist them. Sensing Abra's psychic powers, Rose and her gang seek out to harvest her steam. Unknown to them, however, Abra is being helped by Danny, a man with repressed childhood trauma and powerful psychic abilities of his own. How the hell did we miss you? <sighs> Physically attracted to Danny, Rose does make an offer to, quote, turn him and have him join her. However, Danny declines the offer. Fortunately for Rose, and much to her unexpected delight, even at Danny's adult age, his steam is still delicious, and she revels in making him suffer. You taste like whiskey. Rose the Hat is an especially frightening figure because she's a modern update and representation of the allure of chasing the dream of immortality. However, that dream always comes at the cost of abandoning your humanity and moral compass to achieve it. Number four, Julia Cotton from 1987's Hellraiser. Julia is bored in her marriage with Larry and is the stepmother of his teenage daughter, Kirsty. After relocating from America to England, they move into the abandoned childhood home of Larry and his deviant rogue brother, Frank. Around the dilapidated home, they find trinkets that belong to Frank and assume he's long since left. However, Frank was ritually tortured by demons known as Cenobites in that house, and his remains are underneath the floorboards. As well, Julia was secretly seduced by Frank there, mere days before her wedding to Larry. What shall we drink to? Wedded bliss? I'm very happy. Not sure you are. While Julia reminisces about her past trysts with Frank, Larry accidentally cuts his hand on a nail in the house. His blood seeps through the floorboards and regenerates Frank's remains, bringing him back to life. <laughs> Julia later investigates the room and finds Frank with his new, skinless body. After overcoming her initial shock, Frank requests her help. You can't leave me like this, you can't. Do you want me to do? The blood brought me this far. I need more. Julia still longs for Frank, because long ago she had promised, I'll do anything you want. So she agrees to help Frank by luring men back to the house and killing them. See, it's making me whole again. Every drop of blood you spill puts more flesh on my bones. Frank's regeneration is nearly finished, but Julia doesn't want him killing Larry, so she agrees to find another victim for him. Unfortunately, Kirsty sees Julia bringing a strange man into the house, and, suspicious, stumbles upon Frank's latest victim. When learning of this, Julia worries Kirsty is going to send the police after her and Frank. Don't you care? What I care about is a new skin. Maybe we should just leave. Like this? Look at me. We can't just stay here. My brother will be home soon. Julia finally seems to accept the idea of harvesting Larry, and thus lures him to Frank. Julia is a disturbing villain because she shows that even amongst your own family members, you can still be blindsided by betrayal in horrible and disturbing ways beyond imagination. Conversely, she is also a tragic villain because in following what her heart wanted, she embarks upon a dark path of killing for the love and approval of a depraved man. Number five. Annie Wilkes from 1990's Misery. Annie is a nurse and a devoted fan of a series of Victorian romance novels about a woman named Misery. And as luck would have it, Annie rescues the author of these books, Paul, from a car crash and takes him back to her cabin to recover. I'll take good care of you. I'm your number one fan. In gratitude, Paul lets Annie read the manuscript for the next novel. Annie is thrilled for the privilege, but soon expresses her criticism towards the profanity. 
these are slum kids. I was a slum kid. Everybody talks like that. They do not? What do you think I say when I go to the feed store in town? Oh, now, Wally, give me a bag of that effing pig feed and 10 pounds of that bitchly cow corn. It's an early look into the darkness that exists under Annie's seemingly sweet and Puritan exterior. When her worldview is challenged, it upsets her. See what you made me do? When Annie discovers that Misery dies at the end of the next Misery novel, she becomes enraged. How could you? She can't be dead. Misery Chastain cannot be dead. And the dark side of her personality steps forth again. And don't even think about anybody coming for you. Not the doctors, not your agent, not your family, because I never called them. Nobody knows you're here. She forces Paul to burn his manuscript and start a new Misery novel and to bring Misery back to life. Annie forcing Paul to bring Misery back to life is similar to the growing trend of fan backlash. These fan backlashes have resulted in a series of re-edits, reboots, and retooling of fictional works. Annie's fandom is frightening because we could be her. As a modern audience, we can understand that sometimes spending time inside a fictional world is more appealing than facing the problems of our own world, and we treat these fictional worlds as a comforting escape. And unfortunately for some, the barrier between our world and the fictional world disappears forever. Thanks for watching, Tonglers. Remember to like and subscribe for more exclusive Tongle content. And if you're a creator, be sure to visit the Tongle website at tongle.com for some exciting opportunities.